Thank you for joining us at this STS video roundtable discussion on the future of mitral valve repair. It's also part of the STS Surgical Hot Topics podcast. I'm Vino Thorani, a cardiac surgeon at Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta, uh, Georgia, and I'm surrounded by three rock stars in the field of <laughs> mitral valve surgery. Wilson Zito to my left uh, from University of Pennsylvania, Gaurav Alawadi from the University of uh, Virginia, and apps, I'm sure that everybody already knows Steve Bowling from the University of Michigan. Thanks guys for uh, coming to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, Steve, let's start off. You're the oldest one in the group here. Thanks. Let's start off with wisest. what is uh, wisest. Maybe we'll say it that way. Um, you're, you're, you've had a, a, a storied uh, um, history of doing mitral valve surgeries. It's mainly what you do uh, predominantly. Just walk us through a little bit of DMR and FMR. What's the current gold standard? Start yeah. with DMR. Thanks for having me here, first of all. And I, I mean, DMR, degenerative disease, primary disease is really repaired. It's rare, and, and you know, our goal is 100% repair rate. That really makes a difference to the patient. Non-MS patients. Exactly. Non-rheumatic, um, non-calcific, non-MAC, non and maybe we'll talk about, but your garden variety, degenerative, myxomatous, they should all be repaired, and you should all get a perfect repair. In the past, as I was training and coming up, we said, okay, we'll leave one plus or two plus. That's probably okay, that's not okay. So we should repair it with a very low mortality, morbidity, and we should leave no MR. Be it with a resectional technique, be it with neocords, band, sure. or ring, doesn't all those, matter. All, all those things above. doesn't matter. Here's what matters is you get a zone of coaptation and the patient has no MR. By the way, what's the zone of coaptation that you like? So a uh, normal zone of coaptation because should this be- This becomes important for newer technologies. Right, eight or nine millimeters long, six, seven, something like that. Uh, but that's what you need. And of course, as we know, if you come off bypass with a one millimeter zonal coaptation, as soon as the patient wakes up, they have MR. So there are certain things that that is really the standard in DMR. Okay, jump to FMR, Steve. So FMR is still sort of a mixed bag, and it's very interesting for me to see the evolution of FMR since we started doing them 25 years ago, that really um, it's hard to tell which patient benefits from which therapy. I mean, I would still say that a good repair will beat everything and that the default is a replacement, which gets rid of the MR, but of course that probably hurts the ventricle. And then the worst thing that we can do to the patient is a bad repair, and I don't think anyone really advocates for a bad repair. It's interesting that the results of the CTS net trial, which showed that they were about the same, really probably had three groups in them. One, the group that had good repair are the ones that remodeled the they most. They did great. They did great. Yeah. But how to get to a good repair, I can't exactly tell you. We learned a lot from that CTS network. Uh, Acker paper from the New England Journal was fantastic. The most interesting thing to reflect on FMR is the most recent COAP trial in the mitral FR, which was the clip in uh, FMR patients of which came out the same day in the same journal, one saying, yay, it's great, boo, it's not great. And what was that all about? Well, it's really because mitral clip or surgery is not the commodity. It's not take two mitral clips and see me in the morning. It's getting rid of the MR in the right patient. Right. And we're learning that stuff. Well, that's important stuff, right? I wanna get into the mitral clip and other therapies. So right now, just summarizing, surgical therapy for DMR, very standard. Repair. FMR, we're still trying to figure out how to repair those valves uh, effectively. Right. So Gaurav, let's, let's talk a little bit. Let's jump right into some um, FMR stuff. Talk to us about a clip for FMR and DMR. Where do you see that right now? What is the current standard? And where do you see the future of MitraClip uh, over the next five years? Yeah, well, we'll focus on MitraClip and as you know, there are other technologies, but clip mimicking the Alf Beery edge to edge repair. It's interesting, you know, it's first approved in the US for prohibitive risk degenerative mitral valve. So Steve is absolutely correct, repairs the gold standard. There are some patients, a subset of patients that are just, they're, they're too frail for surgery. And those are the population of patients that were first eligible in the U.S. for a clip. And we saw certainly a variation in terms of how good their outcomes were. I think there are certain anatomic things that we look at that tell us they'll probably be a good result. Things like uh, a lot of leaflet is always helpful, both for a surgical repair and a transcatheter repair. When you have minimal leaflet, it's, it's more challenging. But if you also have multiple jets in different locations, a mitral clip's maybe not the best approach. So the so landscape. DM, so DMR now for you for mitroclip are patients that are considered high risk, high risk, prohibitive risk, that have tend to have more focal causes of MR and not necessarily Multi -jet. Uh, mul multiple jets in or commercial jets, right? That commercial jets sometimes. are okay as okay. long as the rest of it's okay. In fact, they can do very well. You can put uh, clips in the commissure and not really cause a whole lot of mitral stenosis. The other group of patients, if they have a small 
annulus to begin with, small mitral valve area, you don't necessarily have a lot of room for multiple clips. So they have to have a big enough valve, which most degenerative patients do. do. So Steve alluded to this a little bit on FMR. Talk to us about what is the current state for FMR now and what do you see increasing over the next couple of years for mitroclip and FMR patients? Yeah, and it's interesting. When I first started doing mitroclip for, for functional MR, I didn't think it would work because, again, my bias is the more leaflet, the more tissue you have, the more likely to repair. And the COAP really changed our mind about this is an approach that's safe. It's very safe for, for patients with bad ventricles who are sick. I think there's a lot of subtleties that we can talk about between mitro FR and, and COAP in terms of what's the right patient the whole thought of, thought of uh, disproportionate MR and how bad the ventricle is, but we do know it's safe and we do know that it can benefit. And so the landscape now is we don't have pa a lot of patients that are referred to us with isolated functional MR for surgery. We just don't see a whole lot of that. Maybe Steve, you might see some of that, but most surgeons- I'm seeing a lot, of, look, seeing a lot of ischemic MR. Ischemic MR not, with, with concomitant coronaries. With concomitant coronaries. Okay, so, there's, right. th so that's a population we're still seeing as surgeons concomitant disease, AV, uh, AS and bad MR, they get TAVR clip or they get surgery. Some of them are sur certainly surgical cases, certainly the ischemics with coronary disease that need their coronaries addressed. Another group of patients that I'm still seeing functional disease is those with significant TR that need to be addressed. and We don't necessarily have good transcatheter approaches. So yeah. that's another group of patients that I'm still seeing and treating surgically, both the two. But so, I think- So in the clip, for you talked about DMR, FMR, where are the current, uh, where do you see the next two years, FMR and the, the role of CLIP? Do you see that expanding? I, well, it, as you know, just got approved this past year. I think the heart failure community well, is- 2019. Well, right. 2019, yes. This past academic year, I guess. So, so it just recently approved, and I think heart, the heart failure community is, is starting to understand and send more patients. So I definitely foresee the volumes going up. If you look in, in, in Europe, Three quarters of all mitroclip cases are FMR. In the U.S., we didn't have the indication for FMR until recently, so I'd expect the number of clips to go up two to threefold. So, how do we train surgeons, Wilson? You've been um, on the forefront of transcatheter technology, from TAVR to to a lot of trans uh, septal mitral valve replacement stuff. But how are we going to train people to do at least just the mitroclip, which is the only technology we currently have FDA approved? How are we going to train people to do this? I think that's a great question, uh, Vinod. Um, I think it's, it's of highest paramount that we have to have surgeons uh, involved um, and help and be part of the development of these new technologies. Uh, but having said that, I think there are operational and logistical challenges with training surgeons, uh, i.e. there are other responsibilities, uh, other uh, clinical duties, uh, and whether we're talking about training already trained surgeons versus their future residents. So I think there are multiple layers to them. But I think the bottom line is I, I think you start with a genuine interest uh, and a genuine commitment. Uh, and it's not for everybody. Uh, I don't expect every surgeon to have an interest in structural heart. So do people need to do a three or six month rotation? Uh, Wilson, how do they do it at University of Pennsylvania? Well, I think that's a great question. I, I think um, a lot of it, um, it's local. But having said that, I know there are efforts now uh, at the American Board of Thoracic Surgery to have a more robust, uniform training paradigm. Um, so I think there's a path that we're still trying to figure out. But I think in general, there has to be some pathway that's, uh, that is committed and dedicated and not just, oh, I have a few minutes, I'm gonna run in the cath lab, see what I can pick up, and then go back out. It's gotta be a genuine commitment uh, and showing that commitment to your cardiology colleagues, because we have to learn from them. No, absolutely. I, I before, think that's an important point. That's that's absolutely. Before we get into some of the new technology, I just wanted to touch on, based on both, all three of you guys, and Wilson's spoken, but Stephen Gorov, all, all four of us do MitraClips. We all are very involved in it. Um, is this something that people should, trainees or young attendings should pay attention to? Absolutely. Or should we just let it go? No, no, absolutely. In fact, th what I'm noticing over the last few years is that we're seeing a shift in the mentality of surgeons and what they think about catheter-based approaches, okay? In the past, a lot of the, the old zealots of, of surgery would really poo-poo things like mitroclip. You still get a sense of that sometimes from, from the established surgeons, whereas you go to a cardiology meeting, it's completely opposite. They're embracing the technology. Of course, to a cardiologist, maybe that's more exciting than putting a coronary stent in. This is changing now. I'm seeing that, I, I'm seeing young, uh, young surgeons, I-6 residents at our program, other programs, 
that are saying, I, I want to learn this, what's the pathway? And I'm excited to hear and, and, and be a part of the, the American board changing some of the, their mentality. And I think the leaders need to keep thinking about training paradigms. That's very important. So Steve, let's, let's switch over now to some more future technology. What are, um, there's pipeline, there's, there's Neocore, there's Harpoon. Talk to us about DMR, mitral valve repair. What are some of the things that we should be expecting? There's Pascal. So just give us a quick summary of, you know, a couple of minutes on DMR, mitral valve repair. So DMR, catheter repair is going to be fantastic. And I just like to say that, you know, learning how to do mitral clips was fantastic to me. And I think we're going to see people look at the hybrid catheter world and the surgical world just as another tool to serve mitral patients. And I think what we're going to see in our education is we're going to become even more specialized. And people are like, oh, how can that be? Well, we now have three rooms, one room of cardiac surgeons, one room of pediatric cardiac surgeons, and one room of thoracic guys. At our meetings and 25 years ago, people go, oh, no, how can you do that? And it's even good. You know, should I do an arch right now? No. Probably not. No, probably yeah, not. Yeah, probably not. And I do mitral valves. That's all I do. And in a, in a hybrid catheter, a mitral clip is just another technique that I think can fit up this patient. But I think what we'll see is we're going to maintain the gold standard. And by in that, we, you know, learn to treat aortic stenosis surgically, we replace the valve. Now we learn how to do that on a catheter. Of course it's good. It's easier on the patient and maintains a gold standard. And I think we're going to maintain the gold standard of mitral surgery. For DMR, the mitral surgery gold standard is, I'm going to repair this. I'm going to do something to the annulus. I'm going to do something to the leaflet. And then if that doesn't work, I'm going to default to replacement. That is the gold standard. And just to think that, oh gosh, because we're coming in with a catheter, we'll replace it, that the, the mitral valve doesn't care how the therapy got there. The biology of the mitral regurgitation is going to be exactly the same. So we will recreate our toolbox and what with are catheters. The, what are those toolboxes so for the, right now, regenerative we, mitral valve? We sort of have two rings that are out there. There's more, but the two major rings are millipede, which I'm most familiar with, and cardioband. And then over here, to do something to the leaflet, well, we have the clip, we have the clasp, which is recreating the alfieri, and we have chordal techniques. We have neocord from the apex, we have harpoon from the apex, and we have a number of transcatheter, transeptal chordal techniques, including pipeline, which I'm familiar with. And I think these things are going to all become transeptal, just as the replacements, our default to replacement will become transeptal. We know that's so much easier on the patients. That technology will replace our te technique. I spent 40 years being a good mitral valve surgeon, learning how to do it. I'm still learning, but if you can take a technology and level the playing field and put that gold standard out to far more patients, that's going to be better, and it's going to happen. So I think just I want everybody to read. Kind of uh, Steve said a lot of stuff. So I'm going to just kind of put it all together right now for primary uh, mitral valve disease, degenerative disease. There are two transapical technologies that will be in trials, or one's in trial now, one will be in trial probably later this year. That's the harpoon and neocord, transapically. There are transeptal pathways that hopefully over the next one to two years will be coming. Um, and then there are, um, there's the clip which is already approved, um, and there will be the class under Pascal, uh, a study protocol by Edwards, which will, is now already in analysis, the class, uh, uh, class 2D um, study. So those are the five technologies that are going to be coming in for degenerative mitral valve repair. Just talk to us, and you mentioned this, Steve, a uh, little bit, but Gaurav, just tell us a little bit about the two rings. There's the, the, the millipede and the cardio band. Um, they're not just for degenerative, potentially. They're mainly for functional. Can you yeah. just talk about so, that? So the original studies for cardio band focused a lot on the functional patients, as you know um, well, and, and that, that was in Europe. And, and essentially showed that there could be a significant reduction in mitral regurgitation that was sustained at a year. And we can get into repair versus replace because that's, that, that's going to need to be other studies that need to be done, particularly for transcatheter. That's another hot topic for Next time. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, but we do see that, that it's, it's, it, you're able to do it under real-time echo guidance with a ventricle filled. And that's obviously the big difference between transcatheter approaches and surgical approaches where we arrest the heart, fill the ventricle in multiple different ways, do our repair, and pray that it's okay, but not know until you come off pump. And so that's certainly the beauty of the transcatheter approaches. And, and millipede being the other one is a complete ring, again, mimicking a complete ring ring for surgery, uh, which you know Steve can probably tell us a lot more about. But um, both of those try to replicate what we do surgically 
primarily for functional MR, but certainly can be used for degenerative disease as well. You know, I think you said a super important thing, which is you don't have to be a good guesser because we're doing it yeah. under direct loading on the TE. And I think many and, and, of the Or ice, or ice, not or just TE, but also ice. ice. But some takes the guess out of it because yep. I think a lot of the surgical trials failed because we weren't good guessers, and this takes it completely away. Technology replaces your oh, guessing. Well, that's one of and our that, goals, You talked I about think. leveling the field. I think this that's, is that's important. That's right. It's, it's taking people like Steve, that you've been an expert in mitral valve uh, for so long. We're taking it almost to more people, right? More surgeons will be able to do this, and that'll be better for our patients. At the end of the day, we're doing all of this for the benefit of our patients. So we've talked a lot about the repair part of it, but I do think it's important uh, I think we'd be remiss not to talk a little bit about the replacement portion of the functional MR and some of the future of that. Um, Wilson, you've been a leader in this, so can you just talk to us a little bit about the mitral valve replacement for FMR? Absolutely, and, and I would echo what Steve said. And, um, uh, we've lessons learned from surgery. Uh, those don't principles... Him, don't compliment him too much, he'll get a big head, so just... Too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> lessons learned from surgery, uh, we have to be aware of that. Just because we may have a new tool doesn't mean we should be replacing every single valve. So I think that is a very key point that needs to be out there. But it is another tool, um, as Steve mentioned, um, and if we can do this in a way that's less invasive, I think we know that it's going to be better for the patients, especially in a challenging population such as FMR, where surgically over the last couple of decades we've learned a hard way that maybe surgery is not the best option in, in, the, in the wrong or the poorly as uh, selected patient population. So, and largely, there have been a lot of excitement um, and many, many platforms out there, I'm not gonna name them all, but um, there was a lot of excitement and early on, I think the common misconception was this is TAVR in the mitral position. And I think we've learned the hard way that that is not the case, that the pathology and the physiology is very different. Uh, the technical skills to Patients do it are, are different. Patients are sicker. The ventricles are, are different. And in a lot of the devices, as, as you would imagine, early generation were larger and, and they were transapical um, predominantly. But I think most of us would agree it has to go transeptal. Uh, and I think that's the way it's going to be. Uh, but we're still trying to figure out to find that sweet spot. But I do think TMVR replacement, big R, We'll have a role at some point in the future in an appropriately selected patient. Now look I think if I can comment on that, I agree yeah, with you, Wilson, 100%, that we don't need to replace everything. And we've learned from surgery that a good repair does really well. But we don't That's exactly good. know how to get there. And our default, if we do surgery and miss on that good repair, we go down to a bad repair, and now we have to do something else to the patient. But I think the catheter does two things for us. One, it takes away the guessing part. We're more accurate about whether we're going to get a good repair. And if we repair it in the right way for FMR and it does fail or the patient has another infarct and change their geometry, now we have a platform to plunk a replacement into. In a I think that's stage fashion. The, yeah, six yeah. months later, two years later, Correct. now you have a ring or something in there as a platform to plunk a very specific valve into that. So that's, I think, so, important when it comes to these re new repair technologies because mitral clip can in some ways make that bridge a little more challenging bridge, right. you know, for a, a replacement. There, are, there is technology coming out to be able to remove a clip or, or move it to the side, but up till now that essentially has burned the bridge. And I think all the new technologies are taking that into account and thinking in the long view for the patient. So, I mean, as we talk here, I mean, we could go on for another 30, 40 hours talking about this, but what we've discussed in 20 minutes is that in there's a major, the toolbox for mitral regurgitation is expanding exponentially from the traditional stuff that Steve and others have led the field into, but now into transcatheter, transapical, transeptal. So the toolbox is expanding. I think that over the next five years, we're gonna see a complete radical change of how we deal with mitral valve disease. Um, again, thank you so much for the three of you. I think this has been a very uh, engaging uh, uh, conversation and I think that for the listeners, this is just the beginning. As we start with trials now, expect this field to completely explode on how we manage mitral valve disease. Again, thank you so much, guys. And surgeons are leading the charge.